Now that we've learned about demand, let's learn about supply. First, let's remember that when we talked about demand, we were talking about buyers and their behavior. Today, as we talk about supply, we'll be talking about sellers and their behavior. The basic definition of supply is the quantity sellers are willing and able to produce or sell at various prices. This indicates that sellers are going to make different amounts of their product depending on what they can charge for that product. On the left is what we call supply schedule. Notice that it indicates two things, or two variables, price and quantity. Let's imagine this is the supply schedule for lawns mode. What I mean by that is let's make you into a supplier. Let's say that you've decided that you would like to earn some money for Christmas presents. And you've decided you're going to mow some lawns in order to earn that money. You're now the supplier of mowed lawns. If you go around the neighborhood and ask people if they would like you to mow their lawn, let's say that they were willing to pay $15. Well, $15 isn't very much, especially considering the fact that you will have to put some gas into your lawnmower. So you decide that it's still something, though, and so you decide that you're willing to mow two lawns a week um, and give up maybe a few video games or a little time with your friends in order to do that. If instead the price was $30 and people were willing to pay you $30 to mow their lawn, perhaps now it might be worth it to you to um, play even fewer video games or not spend so much time with your friends or even, you know, forbid, um, do less homework. And so you do six lawns. You decide you're going to supply six mowed lawns. At $50 a lawn, you think, well, wait a second, $50 a lawn, I could buy a riding lawn mower, make my job pretty easy, and I could do at least 10 lawns a week. At $60, perhaps you'd be willing to do 16 lawns. At what's happening on the supply schedule, you may notice that as the price is increasing, the quantity that you're willing to supply is increasing as well. We can move these price and quantity over to our supply line we can treat them as coordinates on our graph, just the way we did for demand. And so at $15, we put a dot at 2, at $30, a dot at 6, at $50, a dot at 10, and at $60, a dot at 16. And then we draw a line through it. Now we can see a graphical representation of the supply of, of mowed lawns. You can even find out in between those prices. If you go to 35 on our graph, $35, you could follow it over to the supply line and then down again, and you could see what would the quantity be supplied be at $35 or $45 or $55. All right, let's clean this up a little bit and just look at a supply line. Notice that it is upsloping, or in other words, it has a positive slope. You will notice that whenever we talk about supply in this class, it will have a positive slope. I will tell you it is possible for supply to have a different slope than this, but we're not going to deal with that right now. The law of supply, then, is as price goes up, the quantity supplied goes up. And as price goes down, the quantity supplied goes down. Let me show you a quick video to help you better understand this concept. Good evening and welcome to a special hour of 2020. Tonight, myths, lies, and downright stupidity. We investigate 10 things about your love life, your health, and your money. It turns out that much of what we think we know is wrong. For example, myth number 10, we start there, the world is running out of oil. Now, how can that be a myth? Everyone knows that's true, isn't it? Go organic for Earth Day. At Earth Day events last month, people were quick to tell us we're running out of oil. It's running out quickly. We're going to run out really soon. It's an unrenewable resource. It's running out a lot sooner than you think. But what people don't know is that there's a vast supply of oil just 500 miles north in Canada. The tar sands of Alberta alone contain enough hydrocarbon to fuel the entire planet for over 100 years. What's he talking about? 
this is what the Canadian tar sands looks like. It's a Florida-sized patch of this disgusting stuff. Sand and rock mixed with oil. Lots of it. We're talking trillions of barrels, the whole planet, from Alberta for about a century. Peter Huber, co-author of The Bottomless Well, says people think we're running out of oil because we're running out of cheap oil, the kind that's found in the Middle East, already liquid, clean, and ready to refine. It's very cheap to get that oil out of the ground, so of course that's where people go first. They can pull it out of the ground for five bucks a barrel. Less. That was once true in America, as Jimmy Stewart celebrated in the movie Thunder Bay. It costs three times as much to get oil out of these tar sands because they have to add hot water to the sand to separate the oil. But now that oil's expensive and likely to stay that way, companies find it profitable to do this. So you can see that the example of supply in real life. Why is it that as the price of oil increases, we have a greater supply of oil? Well, at a greater prices, some of these tar pits, I think they called it, um, in Alberta, are now, it's now profitable to extract the oil from that. At lower prices, it's not profitable to do that. They're going to get the easy oil. And so at lower prices, we're going to have less supply. And at higher prices, we're going to have a greater quantity supplied. Just like demand, we have two possible changes when we talk about supply. The first change is called a quantity supply change. This is caused by a change in price, and it causes a movement along our curve. Now remember, our supply curve, the whole point of it is to show all the possible quantity, all the quantities that we are willing and able to supply at all the possible prices. And so when the price changes, we don't have to change our supply line. All we need to do is move from one point on our line to another point. So look at P1, follow it along to your with your eyes till you get to the supply line and then down, you can see that at P1, the quantity that will be supplied is Q1. At P2, a lower price, the quantity that will be supplied is Q2. Q2 is less than Q1. As price has decreased, the quantity supplied has decreased. Now notice, I have not said that the supply has decreased because the supply represents all the quantities at all the prices, and that has certainly not changed. Our supply line has remained the same. The second kind of change we can do is a supply change. This refers to a change in anything else that changes the amount sellers are willing to supply. In this case, the entire curve will shift. This will look something like this. Let's imagine that this was the, was the supply for, well, oil. And just for a simple um, excuse, let's say that we had um, a disaster that, like a hurricane, that interrupted the pipelines, the oil pipelines. We, could, we couldn't get as much oil as we used to. Well, that would reduce the supply of oil. And our supply line would shift to the left because at all the possible prices, less oil is now being supplied. And so that is called a decrease in supply, and it is a shift left. Just like when we shifted demand left, that was a decrease in demand. Well, what are the things that actually will change supply? I do have an acronym, but it's not as good as our timer for demand. This one is called Get Pin. Let me know if you come up with a better one. But this stands for the six things that might change supply. The first one is government regulations. Now, under this umbrella of government, I'm including things like environmental regulations, safety regulations. I'm also including taxes. When the government gets involved with regulations or taxes, supply is going to decrease because some of the company's resources will be going towards satisfying the regulations or paying the taxes and not making the product. Um, as an opposite reaction, governments can also provide subsidies and this is when the government um, grants money to a person or group to support them in producing something that they think will be in the public interest. So if the government pays you so much to plant corn, you're probably going to plant more corn, and that will increase the supply. Expectations. Businesses have expectations just like people do. 
Right now, they may be thinking about the Christmas that's coming up and deciding what they expect the economy to be like at that point. And so that may determine how much they choose to supply of their product. Technology. Technology um, allows businesses to be more efficient and to create more of their product cheaper. And so additions of new technology will usually increase the supply of a product. Prices of other goods that could be produced or alternative outputs. If I'm a corn farmer and I see that the price of wheat has skyrocketed and is much higher than the price of corn, I may choose to make wheat instead of corn. And so the supply of corn will decrease, not because the price of corn has changed, but because the price of wheat has changed. Input cost. The cost of making my product definitely determines how much I will want a supply of it. If my inputs, meaning my resources, increase in price, then the supply is going to decrease. If input costs decrease, supply will increase. There's the inverse relationship. Number of sellers. Well, this is fairly self-explanatory. If there are more sellers of a product, the overall supply will go up. If there are fewer sellers of a product, the overall supply will go down. These are the six things that will change the supply line and cause our supply line to shift to the left or to the right.